I absolutely love living in Chennai. Uh, I love the food. I love the um, beaches, uh, the cycling everywhere, um, getting run over by 23C multiple times. All <laughs> the five year 23c bus uh the mother kalash crossing is a favorite uh, yeah i'm like how many near death experiences can one person have in the same day Welcome back to Insti Unfiltered. Today we're joined by Sri Lakshmi Ramachandran, who is a 2017 graduate of the Integrated Master of Arts program in Development Studies from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences of IIT Madras. After graduation, Sri Lakshmi worked for a few years in the urban development, urban mobility sector as a research analyst and a research manager, after which she decided to move back into academia. She's currently a doctoral scholar of urban mobility in the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment at Concordia University, Montreal. So today she joins me to chat about INSTI and post-INSTI life, um, what uh, thoughts and feelings went into the career choices she has made so far, and what pursuing graduate school after working in the industry for a few years has been like. So Sri Lakshmi, thank you so much for joining me and joining the podcast today. Um, so to start off, could you perhaps um, give us a brief overview of what your current research is about as part of your PhD. Right. So this is the kind of question that everybody dreads. You mustn't ever ask a doctoral scholar this question, especially if they haven't appeared for their comprehensive exams yet. No. Um, so uh, I am focusing on urban mobility in India. That is the broad field and it is admittedly broad enough. But um, under that, I am looking at uh, urban living labs and how they have a kind of role to play in shaping the way we view urban mobility challenges, urban mobility needs in India. Um, I'm looking at them as this experimental methodology by which cities are trying to innovate urban uh, mobility challenges. I'm also looking at them as uh, probably a method by which cities are trying to hack mobility Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this is um, found in literature centering northern, oh, actually not even northern America, but only Western Europe so far. Mm -hmm. So much of this work is, uh, you know, not in the Indian context, mm -hmm. not produced in the Indian context, but um, um, it is uh, being done in India, as with all, a lot of fads that we follow in Indian policy making. Urban living labs are also mushrooming across smaller Indian cities. So mm -hmm. I'm investigating a few fun things going on here, which is why smaller cities, uh, uh, we don't have a city level urban living lab in Bangalore, for instance, which is where we usually expect this to first uh, pop up. And the smaller cities, um, like smaller cities, uh, the first one that's had it is Panaji uh, in Goa. They wound it up at Panaji. They are considering it in Bhopal, Bhubaneswar, Vizag. Mm. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it is quite interesting. I'm trying to just follow on a few leads here. Mm. I know there's one in Hyderabad. Triple IT mm. Hyderabad's got one. Uh, in Bangalore, we have more subsidy, mm. much more localized interventions, but not at the city, city level. Mm. Notably, the, the cities that do have urban living labs have it in in tandem with their smart city projects. Right, right, right. Yeah. So uh, there are some linkages I'm trying to investigate uh, here, not just smart cities, but also linking it way back to Jandrum uh, of the previous administration in the 2000s. So yeah, I'm looking at them all as urban rejuvenation programs and how uh, typically in any urban rejuvenation program in India takes a shape of a mobility infrastructure upgrading or, uh, you know, Hacking mobility, that's what I'm trying, trying to study. That is one part of what I'm trying to do for my PhD because there's not a lot going on in India. I can find a lot of literature uh, for other contexts. I hope to produce some literature for India, 
but <laughs> um, since the uh, interventions are so low scale and uh, we've still not had a lot of time with this idea yet um i'm looking at other things including gender technology mobility uh, infrastructure so i'm coming at it from very science and technology studies perspectives okay so you've uh, kind of moved back into academia yeah. um do you plan to stay on after the program is done what do you hope <laughs> no i keep insisting to my supervisors i am not here for the long run <laughs> i just want to get my phd and leave and they respect that which is always great because you know we are all able to have an honest conversation about how it is not exactly uh, you know a bed of roses here in academia yeah yeah, yeah of course uh, <laughs> no so the thing is um, i never thought i would do a phd <laughs> <laughs> it was never part of the plan in fact so much so that doing my masters project itself uh took all every ounce of energy in me um yeah I, i was almost routinely breaking down in my supervisor's office um uh yeah i was also holding down a few other um, forts back then i was a branch counselor that year um and i tend to give in a lot of time to these admin um you know run around kind of things because they are all in my mind easily achievable more tangible uh <laughs> goals than what academia usually outlines for us including various stages of the master's dissertation mm -hmm. so do i work on submitting my literature review which is due in 3 months or do i go out and uh debate with the alumni affairs uh, office about how much money they can give the final year students a stipend to do some uh part time work for them <laughs> was always an easy answer for me because i'm like this is an easier more achievable more timely goal for me to pursue than the three month <laughs> away yeah. goal just the literature review academia is the long haul for sure yeah exactly and i think uh, i appreciate the ability to manage uh time and tasks that uh, usually doesn't come with the territory that is academia mm. you actually can do it very effectively if you know what you have to do and you can plan your time and motivate yourself to work but uh, the lack of an external uh, reinforcement mechanism really i think um, uh, is is it, that makes a difference to me uh, if you don't have that uh in more internal drive then you can't really survive in academia um what i ended up do doing after insti though was to marry <clears throat> my academic abilities because that's what we are best trained for mm -hmm. uh with uh, an external corporate structure so right. that's why i took on these uh, research based jobs in public policy uh, institutions or think tanks because that combines what i don't have in academia and what i have in academia yep. another part of i think maybe staying on academia would mean <clears throat> the three things that you do in, when you're in university uh, environments right which is teaching uh, research or service oh, so yeah. i think service bit i'm sorted yes you want me to do the department uh, chair work or assistant uh, yeah i'll do that you know those are like okay pen pushing paper uh, clearing kind of stuff yeah i'll do that um research yes i like it i'll do it if it's a topic especially that i'm interested in if i have a research grant or you know if i'm able to apply for grants and pursue that then i can do it but teaching has always been really um something that i haven't looked forward to but uh, since i have joined here uh, for purposes of paying rent and uh, buying food i've had to do teaching assignments in the university so <laughs> i have realized that it is not actually all that bad and teaching that uh, especially at the university level works very differently from what i had thought or expected uh, because you know you experience teaching otherwise as you know you're trying to teach your young cousin something and then They so does this mean you will stay on in the university to teach or will you yeah that was always a uh, you know a no go for me but i i actually yeah i am changing my mind on that but uh again <laughs> who will hire you <laughs> it's a question because the academic job market is cut throat to say the least yeah, so yeah. Uh, you know it's more like okay let's just knock on doors that we have more hope of opening <laughs> so you're so, open just 
pursuing both academic and non academic yeah yeah i would still lean like it's like a 70 30 split when i came it was like um, no way but now it's like okay maybe <laughs> if i do have the opportunity if i get it in the right place at the right time <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah and, so something like that but um, yeah it, it is very um, something that i have to figure out yet but yeah fair enough it's been a while but when you when you first joined insti did you have the idea like even a vague idea that you would pursue a career in academia oh no oh my god no i had i hadn't i didn't even have a vague idea what the program was about <laughs> i know <laughs> i didn't have a, i hadn't have the faintest clue what research was right. <laughs> you know, uh, i sometimes so I, like i said i teach here right and i'm teaching mostly like undergrad students first year second year i read their essays and i'm just like oh not up to the mark you know very stingy <laughs> and i'm giving b minuses left right and center and sometimes i take a step back and i remember my first year term papers like, wow <laughs> i know <laughs> so you know i had no idea i don't think i even like referenced till well into my third year or something um yeah I, you know i i did appreciate the fact that we had a lot of learning courses like mm-hmm. a lot of our program was taught right and um, yeah sure research was an expectation and it was a part of all the courses that we took but um i really appreciated how much uh, you know we had to mug i know uh, yeah. i didn't appreciate it back then but and like when i graduated i had to do like 192 credits i think it's different now for like some 500 odd credits for current yeah term. the credit system has changed yeah but yeah but, but yeah the syllabus remains more or less the same i look at my curriculum uh, now and i'm just like yeah there is no other way i would have learned all this stuff at all and um, even though my field here is urban mobility and i am affiliated with uh, urban planning departments here i routinely tap into sociology uh, globalization theory that we studied um i tap into political economy analysis that we've done uh in my previous job i was leaning heavily into my macro and micro uh, yeah so uh, all the time and i'm trying to explain some things to my teammates and i was just like yeah if i had to be the one stop store for everything from economics to political science to disability yeah. to feminism to and yeah it, it's like anybody can throw anything at me and i'd be like ha huh, yeah i i vaguely remember <laughs> and you know i can always ho- hold these wonderful parlor conversations with these name dropping uh, that are <laughs> so amazing you know i half the time don't even remember what bruno latour said but if somebody i know that he existed <laughs> like, i know he existed and i know he's not doing too well now and i know he's dead now so thank <laughs> you a pile on you know that that's that's always something that i would appreciate uh, yeah uh, I, i yeah i i always uh, tell other people who i can safely admit to that i sound way smarter than i am only because of my multivariate training yeah. and uh, we had a much broader uh, you know approach to studying the social sciences in insti than i have ever seen anywhere else and um, i don't think i'll have i'll be able to do it now you know? it's just too much there's this whole knowledge base that's like <laughs> in your head now and if you ju- all you just have to do is if you find a name you recognize it you just go back into it and yeah. It. yeah yeah i know someone said val plumwood uh, when you <laughs> were talking about um, research methods in my phd cohort building class and i was like val plumwood is the eco feminist why are we talking about her here and then i was thinking why do i know val plumwood at all <laughs> remember you know we did val plumwood and at least two courses gender and development and environment and society yeah. that was that was insane for me to realize and like <laughs> well five years well spent what can i say <laughs> it was stressful but well spent <laughs> very stressful every day i hated myself first three years full of uh, insecurity had no idea my first uh, three semesters grades were like rock bottom i'm still paying for that <laughs> it didn't matter because you know finally in the final few semesters you might get a grip and uh, turn your life around but uh, of course a uh, cumulative average isn't really helping you there so yeah. even when i applied uh, to universities um while everyone was impressed with my profile they were always like 
oh, but you had trouble in your graduate, uh, undergraduate program. And I'm like, hmm, yeah. <laughs> in my undergraduate, it was so precise. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, very easy, but um, yeah. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. And I know that sounds cheesy and it is the holiday season. So allow me some, but yeah, uh, I, think I really did. Uh, I didn't appreciate it at all, but uh, over the last couple of years, especially I have come to really appreciate uh, the time in industry. Right. I mean, the MA program is stressful, but it's also kind of notorious for leaving its students completely clueless on what field to pursue because you could pursue practically anything after you graduate. Uh, but for you, what about the program? What about the institute? What about what about Chennai as a city? Uh, helped you arrive at the field of urban mobility, urban studies, transport planning? So uh, again, my arrival into urban studies or urban mobility was kind of accidental. Mm -hmm. I uh, wasn't even planning to do this for my dissertation. This is what I did for my dissertation, by the way. My mm -hmm. dissertation explored uh, the way apps were changing urban mobility patterns in Bangalore. I was mostly just taking Olas and Ubers in Bangalore and talking to people. It was it was fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, I wasn't even planning to do that. I was doing it. Uh, I was going to go deep into some urban studies theory with like studies of violence and expansion uh, of cities. And that, that was what I was initially going for. But, you know, like practicality and uh, I had to identify a supervisor who was ready to take me and everything had to happen on a certain timeline and I just had to switch topics and I'm all the better for it. It gave me my past two jobs and this current gig. So, <laughs> oh, wow. um, so who yeah. was your supervisor? And so you really got into urban mobility in your final year? Yeah, I was uh, really interested in urban studies uh, mm -hmm. as a discipline uh, right from the third year uh, fifth semester uh, organization and development course yes. right 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 yeah so from that course onwards I, I knew okay this is my niche this is what I want to go for because before that I was really leaning into gender studies or gender and development but um, I loved the feminism course but I also realized that if I pursue it I will not last very long I thought I would burn out very quickly because I was too passionate about mm -hmm. the subject and I needed something where I could use uh, the feminist literature and theory that we had been exposed to as more of a lens rather than... I, I instantly decided in fifth semester that this is what I wanted to do, urban studies. And from then uh, on, I think I also ended up finding a lot of courses and electives that we had speak to that interest anyway. So it kind of worked out that way. I have a, I have a slight, uh, something of a slight digression. Um, you realize that you kind of zeroed in on this in the third year but uh, not everyone kind of does that in their third year uh do you not think that you should <laughs> yeah, i'm just asking you know do you think that the fact that you made the decision in your third year has uh, helped you um settle in with yourself you know, um, I say this with a lot of hindsight, like I was in my third year in 2015. So that's seven years ago. And mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been able to articulate it like I am now, even mm -hmm. three years ago that, okay, in my third year, I knew this is it. Mm -hmm. This is just the kind of stuff that you realize in retrospect. Very so there good. is no way you would be, uh, yeah, I don't think in my final year also, I would have been like, hey, remember that urbanization course, it really like picked my interest and blew yeah. my mind and from then on, I've just been stuck with it. No, I uh, was uh, swayed a lot when I had this elective called religion and modernity. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe that's something that I would like to pursue because again, I had a lot of angst to tap into. <laughs> <laughs> it really helps when you have some <laughs> internal drive to pursue some strand of research, you know, but also that also burns you out. So remember that. Yeah. But um, it is good to be able to identify your interests. In third year is ridiculously early. I wouldn't say that you should have known by then. Um, this is not like uh, dating or anything. And it doesn't work that way, even when you're figuring out your state of relationship either. So why <laughs> try to uh, force with something that isn't happening? Um, you can, uh, uh, all you need to do, I think, is um, once you get into the program and maybe the first few semesters have passed, you should be 
uh, or cultivating an open mind and identifying your interests mm -hmm. that is something you should actively do for yourself because that really helps um, ameliorate a lot of anxiety that you'd have about um, the future mm -hmm. because uh, how else do you know what you're working towards right like again like I said this lack of small achievable goals Mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis really works against uh, social science education life in social science academia I think mm -hmm. so um, for you to identify something that interests you and read around it pursue it more speak to professors that are teaching those subjects around their research interests and working with them would really make a huge difference is what I think and to that end I am a great advocate of internships you mm -hmm. have five days holiday intern for 30 days yeah, yeah I, I took an internship every time we had a vacation like summer winter all of them um I I interned from the first summer itself I the only um, time I didn't do an internship was my first winter break like after the first semester yeah. between first and second semester that's the only time I didn't do an internship I'm not saying this is some great thing and it's an easy thing or anything um you have to beg plead um, take a lot of deals to get an internship but you should pursue it and I know the internship cell is doing a great job like when uh, it, it's, it's it's a lot of commendable effort under the, among the student body in the department to get people internships and get people placements we didn't have it um, quite as organized back then but uh, absolutely do internships uh, in my and my, my internships don't even make sense now sometimes and I put all of them on my CV and everybody's like wow you have such a uh, diverse background I'm like yeah yeah <laughs> and the best thing with internships is you cultivate contacts we keep complaining about how you know we don't have an industry uh, academia relationship that most of the engineering departments have and that's true even here I found that engineering faculties do have more of a relationship with um, industry uh, leaders by virtue of these leaders graduating from these programs but also um, uh, these industries looking to these programs as potential uh, workforce, right? right? And I know, I remember in PHLT or in CLT, there were weekly lectures by some um, industry person or the other for uh, geared towards the engineering departments and we barely had any. And uh, even though we had like department seminars and so we probably had them from academics again. So that isn't really helping those people who are interested in pursuing other things so I would say you have to get out there and try to get internships I'm not saying it's easy and I am fully aware of the privileges that I had in being able to get those uh, positions um, yeah but like take an internship and I you know once you get an internship do not do not ever take an unpaid internship yeah, yeah. yeah that is the rock I'm willing to die on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah it's not okay it was never okay Mm -hmm. I think it is an increasing trend in India now. It wasn't so prevalent, but do not uh, take an unpaid internship. It it really uh, teaches you to devalue your own work. That's what it does. Because you do not value how much effort and energy you bring into uh, uh, an assignment. You do not understand the value you're creating or what you bring to the table. Uh, you, again just fall deeper into your own perception that I don't have any marketable skills. God knows I have repeated that multiple times in the first five years of the program as well as two years after. So um, yeah, do not um, take unpaid internships. If they are offering unpaid internships upfront and if you really think this is the one that you want to go for, try negotiating, try mm -hmm. getting an honorarium, free lunches, anything, mm -hmm. anything at all. Like yeah, just say, give me DA, like give me lunch money and travel costs, nothing else. For me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do not uh, uh, buy, yeah, you have to get some kind of remuneration. It really teaches you to respect your work and your time. Is this just not something that we can get again because, you know, like we don't have those connections, like we don't have those intermediate goals to pursue. Right. We don't also have intermediate results to see and keep us moving forward. So, yeah, at least uh, think of that summer as, oh, the one with great lunches and no money. And that's something still. <laughs> right. It's a so, collaborated this way. I mean, your answer to my question, clarity doesn't necessarily dawn on you early in the program and that's completely okay, but you do have to work 
towards finding that clarity not just yeah yeah and chennai has wonderful opportunities i know uh, again as an urban studies enthusiast i would have interned maybe with transparent chennai but when i was coming into the field um, they weren't around or hiring or i didn't pursue them i don't know what happened but uh, i didn't intern with transparent chennai which is actually unusual i think most people who are in urban studies right now have done at least one gig with transparent chennai so i interned actually with ms swaminathan research foundation and i was uh, working on a project uh, literally called attracting and retaining youth in agriculture which is the diametric opposite of urban studies <laughs> combining labor studies and rural uh, economies uh, which yeah. is something that i did in 20 i think the summer of 2014 so my sec- uh, second summer vacation mm-hmm. and um, i ended up using that and the uh, uh, insights or uh, something vague things that i remembered even terminologies and connections from that when i was in my last job because i was labor economics and uh, um uh, you know <clears throat> economies of work this is just some a kind of connection that i didn't think i'd ever make so um that was one organization i worked with in chennai um in chennai again uh, igcs in insti itself which is yes. yeah um i interned with the shri parmudur project uh, climate change project um that is again another one of those things about peri urban expansion and development that i did uh that again thought i thought i had the audacity rather to think that i can do this for my dissertation <laughs> i wouldn't have survived it but yeah um uh, there are also our professors who work on um issues in chennai itself uh i think uh, there's always been this interest in kanagi nagar if i remember right uh as a social uh, as a space of social production and the political economy of kanagi nagar in chennai itself now after the chennai floods i think there is renewed interest in studying urban topography urban ecology of chennai uh and there are organizations that are looking into that mm-hmm. so <clears throat> it is uh, also possible to see chennai as a city as something that has shaped my um whatever futures also chennai is the first big city i have lived in i didn't live in a big city in, in kerala which is where i'm from so that really helped as well uh in terms of access to a lot of things that i haven't had before like mm-hmm. malls and beaches and cinema yeah. theater like okay cineplexes I, of course we have cinema theaters in my town come on <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah um, i also remember studying richie street for my term paper mm-hmm. uh, i also remember going to saukar pet when i wanted to eat yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so Uh yeah there is a rich urban fabric uh to explore there for sure um i really liked my time in chennai as well it probably helped because i speak a bit of tamil uh, right. although my chennai friends insisted i don't and i shouldn't uh but uh, maybe uh non tamil speakers find the city a little bit more hostile than uh, yeah, yeah. yeah i've heard that as well but yeah but usually you can get away with a lot of Uh, english anyway so that really works out but uh, yeah i absolutely love living in chennai uh, i love the food i love the um beaches uh, the cycling everywhere um getting run over by 23c multiple times on the <laughs> five year 23c bus uh, the madhikalash crossing is a favorite uh, yeah i don't i cannot believe that we survived the madhya kalash crossing i know i'm like how many near death experiences can one person have in the same day <laughs> so uh, that the avin circle all very close uh, to my mind uh, i would really yeah so um, there are opportunities within the city as well and this is something i'm very happy you asked this question because we don't usually think about um, this relationship between the university and the city yeah. i think in india especially uh institutes like iit which are kind of these walled compounds yeah i used to uh, i i don't know i once described iit to my grandmother who is now passed but she said it sounds like a ravana in kotte uh, <laughs> and i was like you know that's accurate <laughs> because we have our own reality <laughs> uh, you can go to be in touch with the city outside Doesn't yeah come. you don't even have to right like you're so self sufficient and like i had cousins outside uh, in like uh, places like basanagar or uh, raipeta and they would text me asking oh we have a power outage or we don't have water and i'm like yeah 
do not relate <laughs> <laughs> yeah insti campus we, we are so spoiled in so many yeah, ways yeah. Uh, due to the city outside my experience of chennai is so different from the other people i know from chennai uh, their experiences there were other kids from my school who went to chennai like leola or stella and they came back like bald and emaciated and i was like I- i'm fine <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, these are uh, the things that we should also consider when we are, so I think, studying in a university. What is the contribution we're making to the city's knowledge economy? Maybe that is something that we should consider. Right. Uh, so that was uh, about your relationship with Chennai and how that brought you to urban studies. Uh, you also did mention that your MA thesis was about urban mobility. So how did you arrive at the topic and how significant has this has been in your professional academic trajectory since right so okay um my ma thesis was also very much accidental mm-hmm. i uh, did an internship with the xerox research center india in the summer of 2016 in bangalore this is the most money i have made in my life <laughs> yeah <laughs> even after that like i had a corporate job i was like i made more money interning what is this <laughs> but, uh yeah so look out for these places it look like the most unlikely places that you will end up in but please mm-hmm. um just keep your eyes and ears open we also have a great network in campus that helps us with these things like this gig i got through uh the placement office in not even placement office like you know the placement um, core circulating a call for internships um so this is not impossible at all um but it's not easy i will admit <laughs> we have to be very mindful like i can't be so cavalier to say that hey it's there just you have to see and take it um but no so i tell that i got this internship and i worked in bangalore uh with this um, human computer interactions group right again did not expect to be doing human computer interactions mm-hmm. in my pre final year where i was still trying to figure out my dissertation topic and where to go from here because most of my academic work was done i think i only had like one elective to do uh in my ninth semester but uh, yeah that that really uh, turned things around for me because i did ethnographic field work mm-hmm. for that nci group um, studying their uh, mobile app uh, the usability of their mobile app so i learned how to do things like usability studies and um you know tech interfaces and i picked up a lot of words which i routinely drop without really knowing what they mean even now it's really it's really fun when you have the right jargon people listen to you <laughs> unfortunately uh and uh, i used i repurposed the ethnographic work i did for them uh, in my masters uh, field work uh, masters data i didn't uh, do fresh data collection Yeah so and you really drew from your internship at the Xerox research center. Yeah, heavily and a lot of work that I did that summer um, and we had like again you know we wrote papers we were presented posters we submitted abstracts so that also made me think and write in a more intensive serious way than I had not done up until then that I wouldn't have done um until I produced my master's dissertation otherwise you know I learned the value of writing concise memos like i wouldn't have uh, got the team leads attention for more than 20 seconds if i didn't say the right words in the first five breaths as academics we tend to spitball a lot or uh, talk around the idea more even though it into our mind it isn't beating around the bush but for others it sounds like that we might be giving them crucial context as to why they need to know this before yeah, what yeah. yeah but no people don't care unfortunately even though the biggest advice piece of advice i got during my masters dissertation time from my supervisor professor rolan vitya was um, text and context are really important they are related and text without context is incomplete and context without text is like a stupid so mm-hmm. meaningless right so um yeah uh, i think it might be the other way around too but like i keep thinking of text and context a lot uh, because of this and uh, even though we're just trying to work up the, our point we are maybe taking a way lo- longer walk than um usually corporate leaders are used to so 
yeah i learned uh, how to speak to them maybe to attract their attention and capture their attention rather that also mm-hmm. helped me in my um, corporate job uh, where pe- patience is really low um, and uh, yeah another thing that i tried to do i have tried to do in a, for a while now is when i submitted my master's dissertation my dad was really excited and he asked me to bring him a copy he is like i still haven't gotten past the introduction and <laughs> I mean, they don't even get the kind of wry sense of humor that we sometimes have when we write some things, and they're just like, "Why are you talking about ran? Like, why are you randomly rambling about things here? What is going on?" And I'm like, "I'm not taking writing criticism from you, <laughs> <laughs> but I value your opinion." Uh, so yeah, it isn't that you know he doesn't understand English or, and he is really interested because this is like, oh, this is a big deal. Like she's done something, and I want to want in on it, and he's like, I. I've tried my best. I can't. So that has made me wonder. Okay, if I'm writing this, and if I send it to my dad, will he understand? Will he follow along? Mm-hmm. So that has also, uh, because that requires you to write in a very precise way. You shouldn't dumb it down or disrespect the other person's intellect, but you should also be able to talk or write very clearly. So these are um, certain things that I learned and. uh you know in those times uh in especially towards the end of my program mm-hmm. i would say these are things that across like, and that has stayed with you across your experiences i suppose i would say that i i don't think i developed it right then i just figured out okay this is a problem mm-hmm. uh i wouldn't say i acted on it immediately but this is something that i'm trying to act on now yeah. like uh in my uh this term that i had to okay i had to write a book review Uh, as an assignment and it was i mean it got they they're going to publish it in the canadian geographer so uh the feedback that i got from the editor is that this is a fun book review i have not seen a fun book review from urban studies uh, before right. and i was like yeah that that is that is something the wrong in our field like everyone it, it's just so dry uh it's very boring most of the concepts that we explore tend to be extremely technical and even i do now i i don't want to read most urban studies papers i end up reading more political science or sociology or um mm-hmm. other discipline papers that talk about urban issues or have urban criticism in it simply because urban studies papers tend to be really boring mm-hmm. so uh um, i understand and i'm trying to change that this is something that i want to change and the editor was like yes please do that it's it's really nice you should do it mm-hmm. and i was like okay so this is a problem across the board you know i'm not trying to toot my horn here i have been writing for a while so maybe you know that has helped but um um it, it's also about learn, learning to find your voice mm-hmm. working on putting that out and not being afraid of uh you know having that voice and having it come across these are all skills you will only develop later it's not stuff that you have to know or do earlier on at all so don't worry too much about it as well i can say <laughs> right okay so at the end of 5 years in the program you finished your thesis and you decided to move on to a job to work what right. were your reasons behind uh, choosing the first job that you chose and did you get into it knowing you'd get back into school at a later point uh reasons i didn't get placed on campus simply put uh any number of reasons uh, it was i think uh, the tornado the first tornado that hit uh, chennai that time so we had like a cur- commuted uh, placement season mm-hmm. i think they uh, was the cyclone uh, i forget the name yeah like, i also forget the name uh, but like those are just varda, like days varda yeah varda yeah and, and the, that's the december i think i have like shut out of my memory and like <laughs> will not look under <laughs> it's just this, <laughs> giant carpet mound in my mind that i used to look under it it is it was a horrible december to say the least and it's not only because i didn't get a placement mm-hmm. but also you know for various other reasons i wasn't doing very good mentally at all like anxiety was at long time high i was uh my supervisor himself was like oh, kind of getting out of hand here i don't know if i'm your academic supervisor or your hand holder or your <laughs> handler i don't know what is going on uh, i was his first mentee uh, from the department like i was his first student to do the masters um uh, supervisorship for him as well so he was like you guys are really burnt out 
he he's also german right so he's like you you guys work a lot like <laughs> and now in retrospect like it's been 5 years and i'm like yeah that was a burnout yeah, i could never do that again i couldn't do any of that again like ever oh no, yeah and like it was unrelenting right like we've been at this for a really long time trying to be overachievers and uh, it didn't even occur to us that we were overachievers in many ways just being in iit uh we didn't really and en- en- understand the kind of competitive environment we created help set up uh help win and yeah we've just been doing this for a really long time that i yeah sometimes i look at my nephew slacking off and like my cousins get anxious and i'm like please like at least let them have a childhood <laughs> we all lost it <laughs> what is wrong with you what did great marks get me or you <laughs> come on at least they look happy that's all that matters i i think i forgot how to be happy without being sarcastic or dark about it <laughs> let's please give them the gift of a good sense of humor yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh yeah that is something we need to keep in mind like uh, I, and uh, i am really thankful for my supervisor because because of his outsider perspective he was like you guys are doing way more than you should be i haven't done this much um and i have like a phd and like multiple degrees after and i had like i enjoyed my youth and like saw the world growing up and you know when i graduated I, that's what i wanted to do i was like yes every year i will save up money for two things one to not be stuck in a in a position or place that i didn't want to be because of xyz reasons i shouldn't have to you know stick to something just because i don't have the money so that was one thing i was very careful about the second thing is i have to save up and travel or see something new or experience something different or fun so these were two goals that i had when i left uh, in st so that really like you know by the time i was in my final year i knew the only way i could do that was to get a job and that was so important and that was so necessary for me uh, that sort of financial independence and ability to support myself and these are all kinds of bratty things that uh, i can say because you know i was uh, taking advantage of a lot of privilege that i had that way i would admit that readily but um, yeah these were all very important for me to do and that's, that's um, one of the reasons you took up the job as well yeah and uh, that those are not good enough reasons to take up a job with, like flash news spoiler alert <laughs> <laughs> um because uh, you should also consider if it's a really good fit for you i didn't go re- directly to my corporate job after uh inst i was working with a social or nonprofit social mm-hmm. enterprise so that was in delhi it was a new city it was everything was new um but yeah i did uh, make just about enough to scrape by fine and uh support myself and uh, it was such a huge validation for me because you know i had done 5 years of de- um, i had a master's degree what do i have to show for it i have a job i don't have like you know uh, i i'm yeah that was really good uh, for me that way right and all those other plans about uh, oh I, i i will live my life on the fly and all that. yeah that flew out the window very quickly <laughs> bills hit you hard <laughs> So your second job was uh, working in the Ola Mobility Institute as a research yeah. manager, uh, yeah. which is a different kind of research, I guess. It's it's uh, it's not the kind of research that we're used to in the department. It comes with managerial responsibilities. So can you point out what was maybe better or worse about working in a research position like that as compared to the kind of research we do in the department? Right. So the first job I had had like almost a natural flow from the research that we'd have done in the department. And towards the end of my uh, dissertation, I had also realized that what I wanted to really do was public policy. Mm-hmm. So I, while I was applying to jobs, I was also uh, vetting public sc- policy schools. Like I briefly considered taking up the degree at um, NLSIU. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, NLSIU Bangalore. Yeah. maybe i also picked up on my original interest which is urban studies always and um yeah i had already started applying for different uh, phd roles that i saw opening up uh, in that job itself so mm-hmm. mostly because i realized more, the more the longer i spent um, in my jobs uh, that i would probably want to come back to academia Mm-hmm. uh and that's only because i am interested in research and i was interested in pursuing research in urban 
uh, studies, uh, urban mobility, especially after my master's work. And this was kind of a profile and trajectory that I did want to build on. So I didn't, you know, when I graduated, I said never again, because I was just like traumatized. <laughs> but yeah. I knew that door was always open because those are real like skills and interests that I did have leaving the program. And my, when I changed jobs as well, mm-hmm. I hadn't quit my last job. I knew I was quitting. I knew this, like I had made up my mind about it. Uh, and I was desperate to get a new job. And I didn't even want like 40, 50 days in between where I didn't have a job. Like that was just something I wasn't willing to give myself because of any, some XYZ personal reasons then. Stupid in retrospect. But yeah, um, I I got two offers and then I used one offer to negotiate for the other. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I uh, upped my ask and uh, I got in, uh, finally I took Ola. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm, yeah, that is probably the best thing I ever did to move to Ola Mobility Institute because it combined everything uh, about Ola, the cutting edge startup and the crazy work environment and, you know, bunch of uh, 20 somethings always huddled around a computer trying to do some things interesting. It combines that with uh, public policy and research. That is the kind of interest that I was heading to. Funnily enough, I applied for this vertical called urban mobility yeah. in Ola, but they already had filled that position. So they gave me future of work and uh, platform economy instead. Right, right, right. And I joined there as a, an, uh, a junior manager because I only had like one and a half years work experience when I went there. I, I had a master's degree, so that was an advantage. But um, yeah, I, I was given more... Uh, responsibility than that from the get-go because there was nobody else working with me on that vertical and I was given a lot of freedom to frame what I wanted to do as well so there wasn't anyone constantly breathing uh, down my neck or asking me after my back what is going on the next year I changed uh, my fields completely back to urban mobility now I'm talking about urban living labs which is like an experimental uh, thing rather than anything to do strictly with mobility or mobility right. planning, transport economics, which are, you know, traditional mobility fields that we have. So, yeah, that's... that's so that kind of research was um, different in a way. It but, was very different, uh, but it did expose me to the mobility uh, business world. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely gave me ideas and insights into how Indian mobility works, what are the patterns, mm-hmm. uh, uh, these kind of street level analysis that we, you know, usually don't get, uh, I, I was able to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it also taught me other things like, you know, actual research skills, like me- re- developing a methodology, developing a survey, um, doing it end to end, project management, program management end to end, um, being able to draw words like program management, value chain analysis. These are not words that we use in INSTE at all. Mm-hmm. So I didn't take many economics courses. Like I wasn't, I was an English minor. So even if, you know, that's something that the Finn uh, minor people would have done, I haven't done that. So this is very helpful that way for me to, uh, yeah, I would uh, highly encourage Marry you. the kind of skills that you got from INSTE into a more of an industry kind of environment. Yeah, and adapting them is very easy. It's just about picking up the right words. Like, uh, oh, I say knowledge products mm-hmm. now instead of saying research output. <laughs> <laughs> no? uh, or I say words like um, properties. Uh, mm-hmm. We have to develop these properties under our project. And like, uh, we're just talking about, oh, maybe we should do a podcast so that... Uh, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, let's develop different digital properties. <laughs> and my team was just staring at me. These are all like through and through academics, thorough, but like, you know, from engineering all the way to PhD, never did one day of work in the industry. <laughs> Interned with a prof for their RA, TA positions, you know. Right. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like the corporate is speaking. And I, you know what? I'm I'm not even beating it back. I think we should use it because there are a lot of course skills <laughs> or practices in the corporate world that we desperately need to bring here. No yeah. doubt. Like for instance, setting up a bloody meeting. Oh my God. <laughs> if it's academics involved, it is at least six meetings and yeah. three 
changes and one on the day of the meeting <laughs> that happens like i used to just get calendar blocks and i'm like who the hell has blocked my calendar <laughs> It took me a good three years after Insti to be looking at my calendar app on my, you know, computer to really, like check calendar blocks. Like I've missed the first few meetings because I had calendar blocks. Okay, so um, you started your PhD program early this year. Uh, you also did mention that you had been applying to a few programs over the four years of your work. Yeah. But was there a catalyzing moment where you were like, okay, I'm, I'm going to this program. I've gotten in, and I'm just gonna go. Yeah, I had to make that decision actively. So, till I got accepted, I had to pay exactly zero dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Like every uh, everything was just like emailing and interviews and all of that stuff. So, till I received my acceptance letter from Concordia, and before that, I had applied to McGill and I got rejected also for the same position, by the way. <laughs> And funnily enough, I'm all, uh, it, it's both of them, both Megil and Concordia are, uh, are in Montreal, just like an yeah. you know, distance between them. So we can take classes at McGill. So that helps. I end up taking classes at McGill mostly um, and working and teaching at Concordia because that's where I'm primarily affiliated. But, you know, even when I got accepted at Concordia, I had gotten rejected at McGill <laughs> with the same profile, with the same uh, project. Um, but uh, what I'm trying to say is um, the first real decision I had to make about if I am pursuing this uh, actually came after getting accepted into Concordia because I had to confirm that I am attending and I had to pay an admissions deposit of $100. And I was like, oh, so now I have to pay money. Let's think about this. So mm -hmm. up until then, I was just doing it. I didn't tell anyone I was applying even. I think only a few friends knew, but mm -hmm. uh, it was just like this thing I was doing because uh, there seemed to be an interesting position open and it might suit my interest. But I do have that pivotal moment where I decided, okay, I am applying because mm -hmm. Again, this opening came in our MAD, which is this. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. And uh, I got, I saw it on November 1st. The deadline was December 30th, December 1st. Uh, so I had 30 days to decide. On November 28th, I started thinking if I want to do it. November 30th, I wrote the uh, initial expression of interest letter. And what happened those two days is basically I was like, okay, I have spent four years. Um, I have like different experiences to show. My CV looks interesting, but I don't have one particular expertise. And I was getting stonewalled repeatedly in my last job mm -hmm. uh, because I was, uh, you know, pursuing different collaborators and we were doing many joint projects together with like the ILO, the World Bank, uh, Center for Financial Inclusion, a lot of these uh, opportunities were opening up, but all of them were like, uh, they, after you know we meet and speak, they would request the team members' CVs and they always ended up asking, where is your PhD? This is your updated CV. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, it's like I, I edited the CV like before I sent it to you. Uh, this is my updated CV. And they're like, oh, but you don't have a PhD. If you don't have a PhD, we can't have you on this project. We can't have you as a consultant. We can't have you as a member. We can't have you for this. We can't have you for that because you're too young. You know, because... Uh, yeah, apparently these things matter. Um, if you have a PhD, it shows experience also. Mm -hmm. uh, in, at least for the social science, I think it's not the same in technical fields, so that's different. But at least in the social sciences, when we have a PhD, it is counted as some kind of work experience that we do have. Mm -hmm. uh, I have heard in the engineering, it's actually the opposite. Like It's like time away from industry, if you yeah. will. Because you have to keep up with all the new things that are happening in tech and a PhD is not necessarily the right way to do that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, for us, uh, much of our innovation in social sciences does happen in the academia. And we do have more uh, inter-academic uh, conversations, such as in fields like mine, which had like an HCI component, right? right? So we do end up talking to other collaborators who are maybe more on the cutting edge or the whatever of the field, uh, the forefront of the field, that you do end up being more clued in than uh, if you would, if you were a pigeon hold into a job. Mm -hmm. So uh, for us, it really helps. Um, I didn't think of it as a, an opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. uh, after I came here, I realized it was an opportunity cost because I suddenly realized I was poor. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't occur to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> leaving a well-played corporate job in India to move um, to Canada. Um, yeah, uh, it, for some reason, it was such a shock to me. <laughs> it was very violent. It was very, very, very rude. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I would say that um, this constant stonewalling really pushed me. And when I spoke to my, uh, you know, my uh, seniors in the organization as well, we were like, okay, you know, this is how you, things are going. This is how we will be moving. This is how your interests are moving. So we have to find a way to match these up or we have to find a way where you will be happy. You know, so these kind of honest conversations also worked because this is also a team that was still building and changing with uh, very everyday concerns in the previous job that I had that is uh, that you know it had uh, a lot of opportunity or uh, you know uh, we, 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 we were able to speak honestly in the team so that also helped me to understand what I would want in the next few years versus what the team could take offer me or take me with uh, so yeah these things uh, counted um, so yeah mostly I um, I got tired of being told my CV wasn't fun enough. Yeah. Uh, not a good idea or a reason to pursue a PhD. Uh, also, I was warned against doing the PhD just for the degree. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have very wise friends that I don't listen to enough, clearly. <laughs> but um, yeah, those who were already doing their PhDs from my batch, when I spoke to them as well, they were like, okay, you have to really be committed to the course. You have to be a self-starter. You have to be very entrepreneurial for your work. You have to really take, um, you know, learn to appreciate yourself for your uh, achievements because nobody's coming here, you know, uh, giving you external recognition. Yeah, so being self-driven, all of that stuff is really important. But, you know, uh, if you're in a research-based job in a corporate environment, you also have to be very entrepreneurial and self-driven. Uh, because otherwise the team can forget about you and then one day they will remember you exist and they'll suddenly be like make a business case as to why we shouldn't fire you and that's when you'll be like oh no they were actually just not asking but I had to do stuff mm -hmm. so I think I was a little bit trained that way mm -hmm. um, I also love working in teams but uh, maybe um, I do work independently all, all anyway. So that that those things help. And these are really important uh, things that we need for the PhD as well. So, yeah. Um, so there's one question regarding the application process that bothers people who are, you know, slightly removed from their last degree, which is procuring academic recommendation letters. How did you do that four years down the line? Yeah, so... I kept in touch with my supervisor, my master's supervisor always. So, you know, once in a while I'll write him an email. What's up? You know, what are you doing? What am I doing? <laughs> uh, yeah. And also, like I said, you know, because I was kind of periodically applying whenever I saw an interesting position, right? So it also helped keep uh, his memory alive of me, I suppose. <laughs> uh, like, oh, this that girl. Yeah, yeah. That uh, basket case that I mentored. Yes, I have to write a recommendation um but also you have to be very strategic okay I did, yeah I had to give given three academic rec references to come yeah. here it's, uh, difficult. Yeah. it is difficult because uh, your master's supervisor will very likely give you one and they might not forget you for a really long time because of the mutual trauma that you cause <laughs> uh, but uh, the other two get tricky now for the other two like I said, uh, I attended the course that I coordinate that uh, Professor JBL coordinated, right? So mm -hmm. in one of them, I met a professor who was based out of uh, Delhi, mm -hmm. where I was as well. And I, you know, we had our own separate thing after the class I attended with him, and uh, he became a big uh, influence on my work. And like, it, it's a whole different thing. Like I, 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 that network really worked out in a different way, and he gave me one. Uh, when I said I was uh, doing this, but he was like, but you're changing field, will that apply? I'm like, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, apply. Mm -hmm. And that was one that I got. Another one also, you know, in my last job too, I met other academics for, again, you know, the research aspect of my work that I had uh, kept connected with. Uh, and uh, I asked them, but they were like, we haven't mentored you directly, so we won't be able to give you a convincing uh, mm -hmm. that's not even ethical and they won't accept it. 
so they said they can't but uh, you know we knew both uh, uh, we yeah we had a mutual relationship that they would uh, give me a letter if i asked um one of them did uh, give me a recommendation out of something else uh, mm-hmm. related to the work that i was doing with him so that was helpful the third letter actually i got from another prof who i haven't worked very closely with in the department i did take two of his courses and uh, i have worked uh, with him like in different capacities but i took a recommendation uh, i asked him because i knew that uh, the team of professors here and he were friends right 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 so you know it, yeah our profs do have a lot of uh, great networks from their own past that we often don't think about because we are just like sleepily attending class and we don't respect this person you know <laughs> i mean i'll be the first to admit i i wasn't the perfect student in any measure at all so i routinely fell asleep in class i'm sure all professors have seen me fall asleep in their class it probably must be very insulting to them but i have fallen asleep there are pictures of me falling asleep in different classes <laughs> so, yeah um uh, they do have these uh, networks and that was a strategic move on my part and i think that really helped because even now sometimes when i speak to the professors here i can connect with them by just uh, talking about our mutual contacts and you know what i did with the, uh, this professor and what they did with him and Mm-hmm. all of that so that's that's always uh, a strategic way of going about things especially if you're applying to universities on the west coast i think you mm-hmm. always will have some connection with uh, our department profs or institute profs um so one like big question to sort of sum all of this up the whole episode up is has working in the industry after school been a hurdle for your doctoral aspirations or has it given you an overall edge i mean i wouldn't claim to have an edge yet but <laughs> i think it has been a great blessing and advantage because i got to see what life outside academia would be like enough for me to want it back right like every day i'm like oh my god i'm not staying here i'm just getting my degree <laughs> out which also is a drive in itself to just finish a degree because phd is so i mean it's funding dependent so you better get it when you still are funded but otherwise as well you know it can go on forever if you don't really push yourself to it so uh, yeah every day i'm just like no no i have to get it done um, it gives me anxiety sometimes when i think like that but yeah it, it is a good driver and uh, i think it also gives you crucial perspective on who you want to be because you are not your work right you are not your research either and we do make the mistake of thinking that we are this we tie our self worth and our identity to our work and our research and what not so to get a varied perspective it is good to have that experience that is completely remote of academia i feel even if it's some kind of quasi project assistant or rata roles that you take up it is teaching you skills in management and you know people interactions and what not which is just the kind of stuff that you don't get when you are doing your own research single mindedly and what not so i would highly recommend getting a job after uh, finishing the degree i know it's not easy i know it's not just there for anyone to go and get it mm-hmm. but um it is something worth pursuing and like uh, if i hadn't if i hadn't made the foolish assumption that the pandemic was over last december <laughs> i would still probably be in the job like it, it had been two years of the pandemic and i finished three years in that job and i was like okay it sounds like you know leave when your poll numbers are high yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i was i was doing well so i was like okay now if i leave everyone just remember i will also remember my time more fondly right yeah. instead of being bitter and um, uh, mad about it or whatever but um, yeah absolutely do at least one or two jobs if you even have academic aspirations mm-hmm. still try to do some because now using those networks that i built in my last job i am able to find uh, my uh, informants and my key expert uh, in in expert interviews for my phd like mm-hmm. i will be going back to that uh, same network of people to build uh, 
more connections yeah that is also very helpful in when you're in academia like i'm also being i've been able to help my uh, supervisors and my lab mates here in getting uh, access and contacts uh, in delhi which is where i was working right so uh, these are all uh, side um, sort of uh, advantages that you have but uh, the main advantage is it helps you think through what you want and you if you still come back to the phd you might be doing it because you want to really pursue really it. Yeah. yeah yeah not because you had no other option yeah I, i'm not saying that i am doing it because i know this is what i really want to do <laughs> i mean i also kind of applied out of spite <laughs> Oh, you want a better CV? I will give you a better CV. <laughs> Hardly a great decision, a uh, great move. But uh, yeah, sometimes when I wonder, oh my God, what what have I done? I uh, I cry about it, and then I remember, okay, this is why I'm doing it. So yeah, it helps. I I highly recommend getting a job after. Um. So we've talked about the MA program. How that has. you know shaped your interest in your career choices but there is a piece of news uh recent news about the department is that the program has been discontinued and we will not have another batch of freshies coming in next year any thoughts what do you think about the whole compressing it into a two year masters degree i mean i think i'll be one of the few people to say that i would really miss it um uh, i think this is very is like you know unfortunate but i know there were practical difficulties with the way that the previous program was structured even then i would uh have have it the other way than this um i think this is a great loss because i was a science student when i came to the program mm-hmm. and the yeah. first couple of years i had no idea what the hell was going on um so by the time i found my feet it was like third year at least and i kind of got a grip on how to manage the program's expectations out of me uh and then you know the next three years it was difficult i will not deny it but you know somehow i think i kind of managed mm-hmm. so um i really uh, uh, also a thing in the beginning of the of, of our conversation i did mention how these dif- different discipline disciplines and training that we've got like in multiple disciplines um has really helped me in uh, you know that has been my real edge i will accept that like because you know i think i have been able to come at issues or research questions uh, mm-hmm. in different ways than what most people yeah would have. like i yeah i have gotten a lot of surprise looks from people when i say oh why don't we use this framework of analysis and they're like oh is that something you can do uh, i will admit that we didn't have a lot of depth in our education but we did have a lot of breadth we covered a lot of scope mm-hmm. and subjects and um, that has uh, that's been quite something uh, for me it has helped me have these different gigs uh, do these various jobs mm-hmm. even like you know consult for other uh, projects and everything only because these uh, yeah these are just like very different perspectives that come from having this kind of training mm. so yeah um i'm sad to see it go but i know there were practical difficulties especially when it came to applying for jobs or applying for phd's um a lot of people found that they didn't have enough of anything to say this is their field or something like that um again i have lucked out so far i haven't been rejected on the basis of that education so far <laughs> uh so i couldn't um, uh yeah but i empathize with those uh, people as well so um yeah i don't think you can physically cram all the five years worth of stuff into the two years program so they might make some changes and edits so yeah that's about uh it I have like a quick five more questions like rapid fire round. Um uh, oh. <laughs> <I can't. laughs> But yeah. So my first question is choose one of the three, the Chennai bus network, the Chennai metro and the MRTS. Oh, MRTS. Okay. Park <laughs> rail for life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. What was your favorite quiz or deadline day prep stress snack when in institute? 
Maggie. Okay. Maggie or Ramu? No, we didn't have Ramu all the time. Okay. So we had a kettle, illegal kettle and cooking. Perfect. <laughs> what is one thing that mattered a lot to you in Insti, but not at all outside of it? Interesting. Uh, deadlines, keeping to deadlines. Uh, <laughs> okay. If I had the courage, I would have asked for an extension. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I learned it way late in my job uh, that uh, it was a possibility that I can ask for an extension. I routinely ask for extensions. Even after I, you know, I came back to grad school, I had forgotten. I had gotten back to my 20-year-old self and I was just stressing out about deadlines. And my mm-hmm. lab mate was like, just ask for an extension. And I was like, oh, that is a possibility. <laughs> it really helped my mental health. It did not. But of course, in my time in NC, I didn't do it well. Yeah. If you had the courage to start a riot about one thing uh, that bothered you in NCT, now, what would it be? Hmm. I think uh, the, yeah, the mingling between boys and girls hostels. Uh, Right, right, right. Yeah, I I thought that was always weird. Mm. I kind of get it now, but uh, I still don't think that we should treat adults as, you know, we shouldn't infantilize adults. Yeah. True. Because it didn't help me coming out of insti. True. I was self infantilizing. <laughs> <laughs> Even now, I can't think of having a male roommate. That has just like <laughs> scarred me forever, I feel. <laughs> Which is weird because I have a male roommate, my brother, <laughs> growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Kind of weird, no? But but it's also, I mean, even the level of uh, mingling that we had yeah. was pretty high for, like, because it was in Steve, we could at least go to each other's house. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. It was still better and I took... Uh, relief in knowing that this is better than most other colleges in Chennai or elsewhere. Uh, we had more freedoms than most of my peers outside in city. I'll agree, but I still don't think we should have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That seems like a riot worthy cause. Exactly. I mean, it's also our, yeah, it's a high level <laughs> transgression, right? So, yeah. Okay, final question. Uh, any in lingo phrase or word? that still has an active presence in your vocabulary. Oh my God. You know, we refused to use Insti lingo when we were on Insti because we were like, we are the humanities and social science graduates. We will not use this kind of... <laughs> yeah, I, at least I was so uppity about it. But now I casually use put piece. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, oh my God, what has happened to me? I said put piece. <laughs> and when it's just like a few insti people us meeting up here and there's like one or two power non insti person we will say words like yeah, yeah i quilted it and <laughs> i never used this in the five years and why am i doing this now i blame delhi delhi had a lot of insti folk and i picked most of uh, them. Right, 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 right. yeah but yeah i used put piece a couple of times this term and uh, i used it uh, to undergraduate uh, engineers in concordia university so it was completely lost <laughs> and it was totally worthless but yeah don't use it <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, our kind of long chat but you know it was very real and um... Well, thank you for being on this episode, Shilakshmi. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Ruthi. I don't think I've spoken to you this long uh, when we were on campus. I don't think you yeah. have. <laughs> <laughs> you were in the same think... department for a year. Uh... Yeah, but you were like Art 19. I still, you know, the when you texted me, I said, <laughs> it came up as Art 19. <laughs> yeah, but it's been, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.